Welcome, everyone. I am Melody Brown Birkins. I'm the director of the Institute of Arctic Studies in the John Sloan Dickey Center for International Understanding here at Dartmouth. And it is my absolute pleasure to welcome the folks here in the audience, folks on the web, and this incredible group of researchers here to uh, Dartmouth today, and as well as many of you in the audience who are part of a workshop, a, a th three-day workshop of visitors from all over the world working on issues of Arctic health. And I am just, it's really, again, such a pleasure and honor to host everyone, and now to be able to hear of the work that's going on. And because we have quite a, quite a full list of, of presentations, I'm gonna go right, right into it and let you know what you're gonna hear today. This is COVID-19 in the Arctic, a community perspective. And this is a workshop and, and work that's being done by a group because Arctic communities are implementing complex public health measures to limit the spread of COVID-19 and not only working with, of course, Western science and uh, dialogues, but also with indigenous knowledge in this process of understanding the impact on communities. The group here came together to specifically look at this. It's being funded by the Canadian government and being led um, by, well, or at least one of the key leaders of it, I will say there's many leaders in this group, is Dr. Gwen Healy Ekirok, close, I hope, um, who will be our first speaker. But what's, what we're talking about today is that in the circumpolar region, communities have and continue to rise to the challenge of implementing complex public health measures aimed at limiting the spread of COVID-19. To fully understand the implications of COVID-19 in the Arctic, diverse data sources are needed that include indigenous knowledge and local knowledge with Western scientific methods. Identifying community-driven models and evidence-based promising practices and recommendations are key to informing pan-Arctic collaborations and decision-making in public health during times of global emergencies. So this circumpolar team came together to address these, this issue and ask several questions, which I won't go into right here. I'm sure they're gonna come up as the, as the panel speaks, but there were things about how, how do public health measures, impl are, are they implemented to address COVID-19? Are they same or different in, in Arctic communities? How have indigenous knowledge and local knowledge has been integrated with recommended and mandated public health measures to address the COVID-19 pandemic? What coping strategies did Arctic communities engage in? And what can we learn from the community case studies to inform policy and program implementations, not just in the Arctic, but around the world in the future, in my opinion, not just the Arctic. So first we'll hear from Dr. Gwen Healy Akir, who was born and raised in Iqaluit, Nunavut, where she continues to work and raise her family. Dr. Healy Akiak, I'm gonna keep working on it because I'm gonna get it, in, is the executive and scientific director of, uh, no, no, it's such a wonderful word. You'll help me. Kariaktik. Um, Health Research Center in Iqaluit, Nunavut. She's also an assistant professor in, at the Northern Ontario School of Medicine and an associate professor in the Faculty of Medicine at the Memorial University of Newfoundland and Labrador. She was a visiting scholar here as a Fulbright Arctic Initiative scholar in 2019, as well as part of our Lancet Commission on Arctic Health that is being done, uh, co-chaired by Dr. Lisa Adams at the Geisel School. Oh, hello. <laughs> and Dr. Daly Sambodoro. Small world. Um, uh, and she was a member, so she was, all, oh, she was, and she's currently here at Dartmouth, most importantly. Um, or one of the many important things, as a distinguished 2023 Fulbright Canada Research Chair in Arctic Studies. We are very lucky to have her. Joining her are Dr. Arya Raucho, Vice President of Research at the University of the Arctic and Professor of Arctic Research in Thule Institute, University of Oulu. She's been working in the field of circumpolar health and well-being, marginalization, research ethics, and human and environmental relationships since 2006. Uh, yeah. We also have Dr. Lara Johans daughter is a professor at the Faculty of Business Administration at the University of Iceland. She is also a member of the faculty in the Environment and Natural Resources graduate program and interdisciplinary program under the School of Engineering and Natural Sciences. Dr. Katie Cueva, raising hands, was born and raised in Alaska like me, we haven't talked about that yet, and works in partnership with Alaska Native and American Indian communities through participatory action research. She studies social determinants of health in, circum in the circumpolar north, culturally appropriate health promotion, advancing health equity. She's an ad adjunct assistant professor of public policy and health at the Institute of Social and Economic Research. 
a CDC CSTE, I don't know what that one stands for, Applied Epide Epidemiology Fellow in the Alaska Section of Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion, and Associate Faculty at the Johns Hopkins Center for American Indian Health. Finally, Dr. Christina Larson is here, is a sociologist by training and completed her PhD in public health. She is the research director of the Center for Public Health in Greenland, based in Copenhagen, and responsible for the research-based uh, for the research-based consultancy for the Greenland Ministry of Health in the Government of Greenland. She's a PI for the Greenland Health Survey, conducted for the Ministry of Health every four to six years. Dr. Larson was a Fulbright Scholar and part of the second Fulbright Arctic Initiative cohort as well from 2018 to 2019. And I should mention one of the co-lead scholars for that initiative is also here, doc, uh, former Institute of Arctic Studies director and distinguished professor, uh, Dr. Ross Virginia in the front row. So we have quite a wonderful group in the room here. And I am going to now turn it over to the first of several presentations you're going to hear from this group as they work through these ideas and prepare essentially a very policy relevant, critical research for the future of uh, public health in Arctic communities. Thank you. Okay, I'll give you, I'm just, and I'm going to come up, you'll see me, you'll see me in between changing slides, but other than that, you can ignore. Okay, Okay, okay. Welcome everyone. Gwen Hilia Kiago Yunga, Ikalung Mutau Yunga, Isumil Tuyu Yunga Kali Yarti Nunavumi. So I'm Gwen Hilia Kiago and I come from Ikalida Nunavut. I'm the, as uh, Melody said, the Executive and Scientific Director of the Kali Yarti Health Research Center. And I'm going to share a little bit with you about uh, some of our early research uh, exploring the experience of COVID 19 in Nunavut. So I think I have control. <laughs> uh, I won't repeat what Melody said, but I, I'm formally trained. What we say is I'm formally trained as an epidemiologist, but I'm heart trained uh, by Ikhalungmut, who have taught me all that I know and I, what I continue to learn about uh, well-being in our communities. And I've been working in this uh, sector for, for over 20 years. <laughs> um, a little bit about Kai Gertit. It's uh, we're an independent community-led research institute. We work to answer the questions of our communities, and it, we sort of grew out of a climate of helicopter research coming in and out of our communities and, and uh, data leaving and not being able to access it. And so we are, we are run by Nunavumut, and we hold the data locally, and we use it for action, hopefully, um, in different ways. Uh, this is not meant to be in here. <laughs> so I think the, the wrong slide, I'm going to skip ahead, but isn't this a beautiful day to go out on the land? <laughs> this is all about a presentation about community well-being and all of the aspects that we see feeding into our well-being, from harvesting to relationships with the land and our elders and our community members um, who learn from each other in the spaces we cultivate, our young people who are part of not only our governance structure, but in terms of telling our institute what to do, but also um, meaningful participants in our projects and programs. And all that to say that our institute builds on the strengths of our communities, and we work to release the capacity that is, that is already there um, that our systems don't traditionally access. So we're, we're lifting up the ways of knowing and being in our communities that are health-promoting pathways. And um, the framework for our research around COVID and for any project really at our institute is based on the concept of which is working together for the common good, that we are all working together for the collective benefit of Nunavumi. And the bigger model focuses on, on values as a framework instead of themes or other sort of traditional research, research frameworks. Our research framework is based on these guiding principles related to which is storytelling, which is um, thinking deeply until we come to a place of understanding, um, being good and compassionate and respectful of our shared humanity. Um, this is what the model looks like, and it's published if you want to find it. It's, a, it's open access. <laughs> um, 
And so that's the approach we, we've been using to look at, at COVID in our communities. This is a terrible slide that I will find a better way to present at some point, but basically the timeline for COVID in our communities was we um, uh, went into the, the lockdown, the public health emergency order on March 20th, 2020, but COVID didn't actually arrive in Nunavut until later in, 20, in November 2020. So we, we were able to uh, delay the arrival of COVID due to a travel ban largely, but also pretty strict public health measures. And then um, the vaccination program in 2021, and then my community had its first outbreak in April 2021, so much later. And then um, uh, the restrictions were lifted last April and the proof of vaccination for travel requirements change in the summer. So our timeline looks a little bit different. That's the only point of that slide, really. <laughs> and uh, so what, when the outbreak first started, we started collecting data from all, all sorts of places. Like the benefit of being a community research institute is that we saw right away what we should be looking at and collecting information about. And so we were working with organizations to understand the impacts on, on them as community serving organizations, how people were sharing food and then kind of looking at different ecological data sources. Our government uh, put out this statement as part of the plan to how COVID-19 decisions were being made, which is, um, analogous to traveling on a trail that we're constantly making observations and redirections based on what we see in front of us and constantly reevaluating so that we get somewhere safely, not quickly. And that was the guiding principle for, for how decisions were being made, as well as all of these other factors like health system capacity, transmission in, in uh, uh, tertiary care centers, tertiary care center cities, testing capacity, et cetera. So this is not a very helpful graphic <laughs> from when you're sitting from a distance, but we were serving community serving organizations like community nonprofits, community wellness centers, harvesting organizations to examine the impact of COVID-19 on the populations they're serving. And, um, and so a lot of our organizations reported they were accessing extra funding to help support communities during COVID, which was really positive, and uh, none of it was enough. <laughs> so yes, we got it. Yes, we need more. Um, the ways in which our community organizations um, needed more support really pointed to uh, sort of core um, chronic issues that were exacerbated by COVID and existed before, such as overcrowding and the need for more housing, the need for more program space, um, the, you know, more and better relationships with our federal government for funding, uh, et cetera. Um, one of the things we observed right away was that people were spending more time on the land, especially in 2020 when we had like the best spring weather ever. <laughs> we even actually got satellite maps of different communities to see if we could show geographically like that um, the trails, more trail patterns, you know, compared to earlier years because so many people were going out on the, on the land. And, and um, as a result, more food was coming into the community. So more country food was being shared, more people out on the land. Every, every <clears throat> community had some people who were on leave because of COVID who still had a salary, who were you know, basically like paid harvesters as families who were going out and coming back and sharing food. And so our community organizations observe this as well and observe the increase in food sharing as a result. Um, this big red part of the pie chart is, is stress. Yes, we're feeling stressed and uh, stress and anxiety was a strong theme in all of the early research in COVID everywhere, but certainly in our communities as well. And um, in the last chart there, we were asking questions about violence because that was a concern among our community members. And so, so some, there was sort of a, like 50% said they thought they were observing more incidents of violence. Others felt uh, differently. 
But basically what we saw was how our community was supporting, how everyone was supporting each other, and by sharing food, by watching out for our elders, with the, some of our uh, stores and the post office instituted elder hours so that elders could go between eight and nine and they'd have that protected space where they wouldn't have to interact with anybody else. Uh, which stayed for quite a while. <laughs> um, people took other families out on the land and shared equipment and respected social distancing. And so there was a very much a collective effort to protect one another and look after one another. And those are all very strong Inuit values, you know? So what we really saw was those Inuit values really coming up and bubbling up to the surface where maybe our systems don't always allow that to happen you know, on an everyday level. And so that was really exciting. We really wanted to document those strengths because the challenges are very much universal globally with COVID, but our community strengths really shone as well. And, and uh, we really want to help tell that story. Um, and so this is just my last slide before you wave me off. <laughs> um, and so the ways in which our communities can support each other going forward. So, you know, we've made these observations through the pandemic, but now going forward, you know, what are we going to take away as learnings? And so our community organizations, you know, talk about, well, we need more education. We need more safe spaces for youth. We need to keep sharing country food. We need to keep prioritizing our elders and supporting local, you know, grassroots initiatives and more money and more. And so now there's a great motivation from all of, all of the learnings through COVID to keep targeting those energies and those investments into um, community-driven initiatives and, and moving things forward. So um, very clear direction from our communities. And that's all from me. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I think it is from Alaska, Katie Cueva. Dr. Katie Cueva. I will take this. You're on. Well, thank you so much. It's um, so nice to be here and <clears throat> to be reunited with some of the folks from the Fulbright Arctic Initiative that I was a part of in 2017 through 2019. It's like a little family reunion here. So thank you for giving us this space to be able to do that. Um, and this work started as we were in conversations with each other because of uh, the Fulbright that we were a part of when the pandemic hit. And we began to speak about, well, what's happening where you are? What's happening in Greenland? What's happening in Iceland? Um, and started to share different things that were happening in each of our regions. I'm from Alaska, so I was talking about things in that context <clears throat> and decided that we were going to put together some research on this to be able to look a little bit deeper on it. And I had the great privilege to be able to work with some fine people who are here in the audience, so thank you to Aya Gufluk, who's here and was really our lead on the ground for our work in Alaska, um, in Nunapachuk and in Bethel, and also Mallory Peterson, who's here, who flew to join us all the way from Montana and had a great outside perspective on what things look like here as compared to where she was. Uh, so in March 2020, uh, we talked with people in two different communities in Alaska where I was born and grew up. And, oh, well, not that one. Uh, let's try that again, here we go. So here's a map of Alaska. Uh, and Anchorage is where I live and work, the land of the Denina people, which you can see highlighted on the map, but a little bit farther west of that is what we call the yukon Kuskokwim region of Alaska. And where that red dot is, that marks Bethel, which is the hub community of that region. Uh, there's about uh, 6,300 people there. So in Alaskan terms, it's huge. Um, but I understand in other parts of the world, it may be considered a relatively small community. Uh, and in that region, there are several other smaller communities, 56 smaller communities in the region, one of which is Nunapachuk, and there's about 500 people there. And for both of these communities, the majority of uh, residents are Alaska Native, 
Bethel has about a quarter of people who are white. It's because it's the hub, there's a more transient professional community that also lives and works there. Um, people who are there for administrative and teaching, and um, there's a hospital there, doctors and nurses, things like that as well. But these are the two places we were able to work. So I also want to acknowledge that we were able to speak with a number of people in these places, and that's what this research is based on. This is our timeline of events at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, so the state of Alaska um, suspended all non-essential medical appointments on March 19th in 2020. The pandemic arrived in Alaska in March 2020. However, you'll see that that uh, epi curve, this is the number of cases over time, but things stay relatively low through the summer. Uh, there were some things that the state of Alaska did kind of right off the bat, um, a travel ban, for example, that really helped keep our cases low, but a number of those uh, bans were lifted. And so our first wave really hit that fall of 2020. So that blue line is cases in the state, which spikes quite a bit in the fall of 2020. And that orange line is cases in the Bethel region. And so in that census area, and it's a much smaller spike, but it's because there's fewer people there. So relatively speaking, it, it follows along with the trajectory of the state as a whole. Also, the boxes in green are tribal events that happened, like a storytelling event. The 1918-1919 Spanish flu uh, was a large event in Alaska's history and one which informed the way that communities responded to the pandemic. And the boxes in orange are things that happened in Bethel, so in that region. For example, the city of Bethel had a mask mandate, which was something that the state of Alaska chose not to do, but individual communities were able to make happen. I also wanted to give you some perspective on this. So this is the cases per day as that top graph um, from the beginning of the pandemic up through yesterday. So you can see that first spike was the largest one that we saw in the previous graph, that spike in the fall of 2020. Um, cases didn't go away after that though, unfortunately, although there was some hope when the vaccine came out. But you can see that we had several other waves of um, of cases and things are ongoing. As Ayagukluk shared just this morning, um, Nunapachuk just lifted a lockdown yesterday, I believe. So there are still communities that are choosing to keep themselves safe by locking down even today. And on the bottom are the deaths by month, and this is in the Bethel census area. So you can see that our uh, mortality rate has really leveled off. So that's good news. Now, in Bethel and Nunapachuk, we spoke with people in groups and as individuals. We had 11 groups in Bethel, that hub community, and then eight different groups in Nunapachuk, that smaller community in the region. And our central questions were really, how did the COVID-19 pandemic impact things for you and for your community? And how did your community respond? And we were really looking for strengths. You know, what is it that helped to keep your community safe? What were the barriers for allowing you to keep your community safe? We also asked a few questions about mental health and about policies. What was the impact of the different policies at those different levels, from the regional tribal health corporation to the city level to the national level, and how did they impact things in your community? And we talked to about 50 people, about half of them in Nunapachuk and about half in Bethel. We really focused on the indigenous community, so the Yupik people of the region. Um, and we also focused on individuals who are elders. So you can see that our age range goes up uh, to about 78 years old in Bethel. And uh, Aya Gufluk helped arrange all of these uh, happenings with people and helped to recruit participants. So a huge thanks to him for making this happen. Uh, when we got our data, we wrote it down. We wrote down what people said. If they were in groups, we wrote it down on big pieces of flip chart paper so they could see what it was that we were taking away as researchers um, and asked their permission for us to be able to use that in our research. Uh, and then Mallory and I both looked at those transcripts and coded them. So what is it that we think people are saying? We did that separately. And then we got together and said, you know, well, I think that they're talking about disconnection from the land. Is that what you think that they're talking about? And when we had a difference, we made sure to discuss that so that we were really capturing what it was people were saying. And the main themes that we uh, discovered from this were that people talked about a disconnection from relationships, a loosening of those familial ties. 
And in rural Alaska, our communities are small and they're very close knit. Um, so even when there's one death or one illness in a community, it can have a ripple effect on everyone in the community, especially when it's an elder, a culture bearer who has a lot of knowledge that they could be passing on that now they're not able to. People also talked about fear. They talked about depression, anxiety, and grief, um, as well as death. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic disproportionately impacted Alaska Native people, much as in the United States, there is disproportionately high mortality rates among indigenous people as a whole. However, there were positives as well. People talked about quarantine packages. So the CARES Act um, was used by the tribal corporations and the, the tribal organizations to provide uh, food, provide cleaning supplies for people. They also hired quarantine workers. So people who delivered food, um, helped elders. Uh, so there's a lot of work done on the community level that was really positive. People also talked about working together, how the pandemic brought everyone closer and really highlighted some of those traditional relationships and traditional values. And I want to share a few quotes from the community members to allow them to speak for themselves. So that central theme of disconnection, so that's a disconnection um, between family and, and friends. One of the things that happened is where people asked, were asked to, say, to stay apart from each other. And for close-knit communities, that can be quite a challenge, especially around times of a transition, such as a, a, a passing away, a death, or a funeral. Um, and so in those instances, there was a large sense of loss that people were not able to pay their last respects to an individual they had to choose between following through on that tradition or being mindful of COVID and following those protocols. Um, not being able to see people, not being able to, to maintain those ties and that sense of caring. Uh, also talking about um, not being able to go see people in a hospital, which is true in many other places as well. However, these are some of the positive things as well, some of that working together. And just this morning we were talking about, you know, this connection to traditional Yupik values of compassion and also a service to others that really I think was highlighted by the people that we spoke to about sharing things, about sharing food, sharing whitefish, sharing moose, um, cut, catching moose and distributing it to elders. Also a kind of a resurgence of traditional values with the fear and the threat of hospitals being overcrowded and individuals not being able to get healthcare if they needed it. People um, turned back to traditional medicine and elders started to teach some of those practices again in case they were needed. And that was really a huge positive. So relying on each other, being kind to people. Um, also that bottom quote <clears throat> about the city and the IRA, the IRA is the tribal government in that community. Give me a second. <coughs> and having two governments in a community <coughs> can be quite a challenge. So that bottom one is about those two governance structures working together. And that is the end of that presentation. I feel like the teacher. Next, we're going to call up <laughs> Arya from Finland. Thank you. I can also change here, I think. I think it's so yeah. good. Yeah. OK. So um, it's great to be here. So thank you very much for this uh, possibility to be in the panel and also having this great uh, COVID-19 pandemic and public health. Uh, <coughs> workshop and, and having the results from the other, other areas in the Circumboral North. So um, in, in this map, I will uh, give you something about the Sami, Sami homeland. And um, so that you can, you can see here is Finland, where I'm coming from. And we have Lena Maria Nilsson, who is coming from Sweden. And unfortunately, not uh, we have any anyone here from from Norway. And actually, this region here is uh, 
um, Sami homeland, main, main area. And I think that uh, many of the issues which uh, I'm now telling is uh, telling also the things which are happening in, the, in Norway and Sweden. And we have been, during this project, we have been working together so that, uh, for example, in uh, Sweden, um, uh, it has been focusing more on the questionnaires. And in, uh, in Norway, uh, interviews and media analysis. And in, in our case, we have been focusing on the interviews and also making some, some media, media analysis. And our focus uh, on municipalities, they have been the northernmost one, which are um, here in uh, Utsjoki, which the, there's um, 1,300 people living. And the most biggest uh, municipality is Inari, and there's around 7,000 um, inhabitants. And these two municipalities, they have the most uh, Sami people calculated as a percentage. And uh, in our case, uh, one issue was coming up, uh, and it was the border restrictions. And usually, this area is without any borders, so that uh, people can just uh, drive to cross the Tornio River from Finland to Sweden and back, and there's no, no one uh, checking uh, any passports or other. And the same is in, in Norway, so that the, there are four different places where you can cross the border and go work and, and having activities and also the families, they are both sides of the borders. We have also one uh, connection to Russia. So, um, and uh, during the corona time, the first uh, case in Finland was in Saariselka, which is uh, in uh, one of the tourist uh, uh, restrict in Inari region. And it was the start of the corona pandemic actions. And um, in Finland, I think that uh, um, the interviews uh, which we made, it came also the information that it was a rather good thing because they need to be prepared and they were somehow more ready to, to go further during the pandemic time. Another issue, which is, uh, of course, uh, very much impacted how the borders are going and working, is the, how the um, national regulations and restrictions are. And um, in this uh, uh, article by the Andrei Petrov and others, so that they show that the, how the corona um, was taken in the restrictions in different Arctic countries. Greenland and Canada were very much closed. And then we have Faroe Islands, Iceland, Norway, and Finland. And we have much more strict uh, policy and guidelines than compared to Sweden. And that was also the impact when we are thinking about the borders, how to do the things, and how the, how the restrictions and guidelines they were changing. And <clears throat> what is the status of our Sami homeland study and COVID-19? Uh, at the moment in Finland, we have made the data collection, interviews, and media review. We have made main uh, analysis, and also the preliminary results, they are, they are ready. And I can say that many of those which has been already said, uh, working together, being together, being in the nature, having the uh, power in, in a new way, finding the new solutions in the municipalities, communities, and people are helping each other. And I think that they are also coming, coming up very clearly, all in our three countries study in, in Sweden, Norway, and, and Finland. And this is one, uh, one result from, from Sweden. Um, as I already said, that in uh, Sweden, there were a questionnaire to Sami people who are living in the um, north from the Arctic Circle. And there were um, questionnaire, uh, I think that uh, there were 
1,500 uh, males and 2,000 females who answer it after the two, the sec, uh, in the middle of the, I think that it was, uh, Elena Maria he, is here, so that it was. Uh, the entire Sami population in entire Sweden. Okay, so, <laughs> so it was entire. <coughs> Okay, so, uh, but it shows that uh, when we are comparing the Sami uh, prevalence of the COVID-19 infection, we can see that uh, in, uh, in uh, total number and also the males and females, they are lower prevalence uh, among Sami than the non-Sami in Sweden. I think that that was my last one. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer the questions. Thank you. Oops, did that wrong. Let's do this. There we go. All right, thank you so much. And oh, I forgot my glasses. Okay, this one's going to be a little bit more on the ceiling. <laughs> hmm. Okay, no, take one second. <laughs> oh, I thought I could. I cannot. <laughs> Oh, uh, so I think we have Greenland next. So, uh, there we go. And if I do this correctly, I got thrown off. Why not? Thank, thank you. you. Okay. <clears throat> well, thank you so much, and thank you for the lovely uh, introduction, Melody. It's really good to be here. And I'm, I'm happy to be able to share some of the results from Greenland. I will be co-presenting, although she's not here, with Ingelise Olesen, who was uh, my partner and, and co-led the study. And uh, Ingelise is the um, research coordinator at the Center for Public Health in Greenland. And uh, we're based not only in Copenhagen, but also in, uh, in Nuuk, in that beautiful black building that you see on the picture. Um, so that's where a lot of this work um, was being done. And so this has already been uh, mentioned in the previous presentations, but Greenland as well is a very uh, close-knit community. Um, some of the, one of the things that played a, an important part in, uh, in the handling of COVID-19 was also limited resources. You only had that many doctors, that many hospital beds, that many um, test facilities, and so on. Um, but also that it's a collectivistic society. It's people look out for each other, protect each other, protect the elders, uh, protect those at risk. Um, so a lot of people were really happy when the country was shut down to protect everyone in the beginning of the pandemic, and I'll, I'll explain a little more about that. Um, but one of the things that we also found in our study was that communication was really, you know, both when it worked well, it was, it was a strength, but also communication issues related to language, communication being done in Danish, but most people speaking Galatli Sud, Greenlandic, and so on. So, and what's so great about these days is that we get to discuss these results with everyone else here, and we're finding common themes, common um, inspiration for, for recommendations moving forward. So these are just some, some overall things. And for those of you who are not, Melody, you'll keep track of time, right? I'll look. Okay, good. Um, so just to give you a little, uh, some statistics about Greenland, um, about 80 communities, um, 64 of them are, uh, are smaller communities and the rest are uh, larger communities. Most people or percentage-wise live in the capital of Nuuk, uh, about 20,000 people. And then the second largest city has about 6,000 people it is actually now and then you know, spread all over the over this huge, beautiful um, island. No roads connecting uh, any uh, any communities, so you have to go, you know, by plane or boat, and and that of course has a huge impact on what's possible handling a public health crisis. So uh, COVID nineteen really entered Greenland on March sixteen. This is the prime minister at that time, Kim Kim Kielsen. and then up until. Uh, January 22nd, uh, a very effective strategy uh, almost kept COVID out, or at least when it came, we were able to control it. But by January uh, 22nd, which is when Omicron came, uh, 
it, there was nothing more to do. It, and then, uh, you know, we stopped testing, we stopped registering, we stopped tracing because just we couldn't keep up. Um, but the good part of that is that we did actually only had 21 deaths that were not necessarily caused by COVID, but that were COVID positive. So uh, in that sense, we, uh, we, you know, we're lucky. So the phases, and these are de defined by the chief medical officer who's been, just, again, like working impressively hard since the beginning as many others in this, but I, I keep being impressed every time that he engages in conversation and, and, and just keeps working. Um, <clears throat> but the first phase was really when it, you know, the, the virus came and then Greenland was totally shut down, so you couldn't enter. And you can only go to Greenland uh, by, by plane through Copenhagen in Denmark, so we were able to <laughs> shut down the country. Uh, it opened up again in April, and then for about a year, the uh, virus was controlled by, you had to test negative before getting on the plane, and then when you arrived in Gre Greenland, you quarantined for five days, and then you tested again, and then you were only allowed to go out, and that was a really efficient strategy. Uh, we didn't have the test facilities in the beginning, but that came. Um, and then phase three was when the, you know, we started to have um, spread around the larger cities. Uh, and phase four, when Delta came, really challenged. And you, couldn't, you had outbreaks in Nuuk and the second largest city, Sisimiu, that couldn't be stopped. And then Omicron came around December 21. Uh, and at that point, you know, as I mentioned, just stopped tracing and testing. Um, and at this point, we're still in the phase six that was uh, from April uh, last year, and then you, you, I mean, we still see cases, but no restrictions are in place, and it's it's not um, uh, no like they closed all of the crisis, uh, uh, you know, all the departments that were set up for that. Um, so in total, we had 21 deaths, as I said, um, and throughout the whole period, few cases of hospitalization, and they were all manageable, and it's very much due to the fact that we were able to postpone um, the large, like the widespread until almost everyone had been vaccinated. And, and so we were both waiting, you know, to make sure that Denmark would have the capacity to help uh, and then sort of postponing everything. But then at the end, when we came there, we were, you know, we were able to, to manage ourselves as well. So I want to share with you uh, some of the, just some quotes from the interviews that we did. And um, like Gwen explained, the model that they're working from at, at her research center, uh, so are we working from a very holistic understanding of health. That's important. So we always start with like, values, relationships, context, honor, respect, um, things that are all key to Greenlandic uh, Inuit culture. And this is uh, illustrated by the framework that we work from. That very much is also something that Ingelisa has um, worked and based on years and years of interviewing and conversation with community and, um, and elders, not least. So you'll have all of the uh, classic uh, determinants of health, like lifestyle and biology. But if you move around the circle, you'll see we'll have local values, culture, language, quality of life, family relationship, community, country food, which is connection to nature and animals, and then what connects everything is the connection between body, mind, and spirit. So this, is, this was the framework that we used for um, engaging and having conversation with community members about COVID-19. And so I'll just give you some examples of what came out of that. So for example, when we look, and this is the, the Greenlandic, um, the word for community. <clears throat> when we look at the sense of community, it's the foundation for health and well-being. So that was illustrated, for example, by some of uh, one of our community members who said, that's why I'm here so much. It's to get that sense of community. It means so much when we older people are physically active together. It was close during Corona. You became very lonely. You felt abandoned. And then another thing that really brings people together is bingo. So that was also brought up. Now, it's different because of Corona. We couldn't go to bingo anymore. I'm so happy to go to bingo in the evening. And, but they asked me to leave because of corona, because you could only sit five at a table. So that really disrupted um, how people were, you know, normally getting that sense of community. And it's important for health and well-being. And, and these quotes show that I see health as the community 
relationship with others around being happy, singing with others, activating each other. I feel healthy when I'm with other people, and I, I participate as much as possible in events here. It's not healthy to be lonely. Health in body and soul is being together in a community. And these quotes are not just relevant for COVID-19. This is really uh, key to every public health issue. People were also stressing the importance of the food, of the Greenlandic food, Kalali Manit. We've had several conversations these days that food is medicine, and I mean, foods ha food has stories. Uh, Anna, uh, Lina Maria is talking about it. Jim, you had a point about that as well. And Pili Nek is also, you go, into, you go on the land to collect the food. So it's quite common here, being in nature and hunting, um, there's no change in that. Being in nature, catching, preparing one's own catch, there's not been a change in that. We've always done that. There's no change of it because of corona. And this quote came about because we were asking people, are you, are you out on the land more? So for example, in a more um, Western context, there was a lot of discussion about people going out and you know, taking walks and having fresh airs. But in a Greenlandic context, this is very normal. This is how you live life. This is how you, you're well with your family. So that was just speaking to that. But also to the, the country food, we may also be more resilient in North Greenland because of that we eat galali menit. That may also be one of the reasons, at least that's what people say. So that feeling of being strong because of the, the food that you could harvest. There was some uh, challenges in the cultural event as well, and uh, people weren't able to meet. And and you know you always gather when there's, well any event event really like someone starts in school or there's a birthday, and and people were uh, really um, creative. You know sailed out and met and uh, and invited people anyway, and then people would just just come in in smaller uh, smaller portions. Am I out of time, Olivia? And so one last point was also um, to really pay attention to local values, both as a strength, but also as something um, that can sort of uh, affect how, for example, vaccination coverage. So if someone in a community um, don't feel safe about the vaccine or, uh, or they do, that will, we saw that that very much affected the, the result of, the, um, of how many people would get vaccinated. Um, so local attitudes and, and uh, you know, the close relationship between everyone was something that, you know, came out as a really important um, issue in communication around, um, and around COVID-19 as well. And um, I think I'll stop there. Boynak. Thank you very much. I can already see how the days have been connecting so many dots as you meet together and how important it is for you to meet together. Um, let's see, I will get to, let's see, whoops, it's getting there. And I think I did it. I did this, thank you, Doc. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm really grateful be, to be here at Dartmouth again and also for taking part in this project and re reuniting and re reuniting with my Fulbright uh, cohort and uh, also expanding my network. network. But I'm go now going to uh, talk about like the research that was conducted in Iceland. And uh, heading the team together with me was uh, Dr. David Cook. And um, we, this is the Icelandic team. So we gathered uh, students both uh, ma on master's level, doctoral level, and the postdoc, uh, uh, helping us with this uh, research. So uh, the overall aim of the study was to identify and assess both positive and negative uh, societal impacts associated with COVID-19 pandemic in Iceland using municipalities in the west skirts of Iceland as a case. And I will uh, show you on map where this is. So the research questions that we uh, asked uh, con uh, focused on the public health measures implemented in general, but also community experiences with public health measures. We asked about coping strategies, the communities uh, about 
both in case of communities, but also individuals, and how they engaged in, uh, in uh, to adapt to the pandemic. And then also because we don't have indigenous peoples uh, in Iceland, we wanted to know also about the impacts on foreign uh, people uh, staying or living in Iceland and immigrants. And we have about 80% of the population in the Westerners that are uh, foreigners, uh, mostly from Poland. So we wanted to explore that topic as well. And then learning uh, from the community case studies to inform policy and program implementation now and in the future. That was our main aim. So this is the map of Iceland, and uh, this is the international airport in this area. We have the capital city here, uh, and then we decided to focus on Westfjords. Uh, we were thinking to begin with, should we go even to this corner of the, of the country or to the to, to northeast or, or this part of, of Iceland? But the reason why we selected this area here as a, a case study is because of outbreaks early on uh, during the pandemic. Really uh, severe uh, incidents where we actually got uh, uh, infections into a retirement home or a nursing home. So this is just to highlight this area here. So we have the biggest town, Isafjörður, but we also conducted interviews in Hnífstallur, Bolungavík, uh, Flateri. So we were focusing on this area here. And this is, uh, these are the waves, uh, early, early waves in, Icelandic, in, in Iceland. So they were hit really hard uh, in these early waves. And this is uh, the, when we started to screen uh, cases at the border, the national border of Iceland. Uh, I also have a, a longer timeline actually showing that the, when we compare this uh, to the overall situation for a longer period of time, these are really, really small waves. But since the, these are early waves, we didn't have much knowledge about the impact. And that is why it's critical to look at these waves here. Uh, so we conducted the data collection in October 21. And we conducted 42 interviews. Uh, and we managed to talk to one of the town mayors, health authorities and healthcare workers, uh, people within the education system, uh, ranging from kindergarten to high schools, but also there is a university center in Westfjords uh, with a lot of uh, students and staff, mainly from abroad. So this is the part of the people that we interviewed, but also port authorities, because they are both in terms of critical in terms of both uh, tourism and cruise ships, but also in terms of the fishing uh, sector. And then we talked to immigrants from Poland working in Iceland, business owners, managers, uh, law enforcement, civil protection and emergency management and others. Uh, and then we have transcribed and uh, translated the, the interviews. Uh, some of them are conducted in, uh, in Eng most of them are conducted in English, some in Icelandic but also a few in Polish uh, with the help from a translator. Uh, so far, we have published two papers ba based on our findings. They are both in open access. Uh, one did focus on uh, the COVID-19 uh, and well-being in remote coastal communities. Uh, and since there was a lot of discussion about uh, the businesses and impact on, uh, from businesses, but also in terms of loss of jobs and, and these issues, we decided to focus on in the second paper on human resource management in terms of institutional resilience during the pandemic. Uh, and I'm just briefly going to introduce two frameworks that we used in those papers for our analysis. One, uh, the well-being framework that we used is very much tied to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And I just wanted to highlight this uh, by showing this image here. But because you can see here in this image that they, how they relate, the framework that we use relate to the sustainable development goals. But this was a well-being framework uh, developed by David Cook and uh, Brynhilde Davisdóttir. Um, and uh, so uh, it has four main categories, which are uh, natural, social, human, financial, and physical capital assets, and focusing on, in terms of the natural environment, the uh, planetary uh, physical boundaries, uh, meaning the natural environment, and then in terms of the social aspect, me uh, meeting fundamental human needs, and by focusing on civil engagement and governance, cultural identity, social connections, in terms of the human uh, capital assets, 
the focus was on human development, uh, cap uh, capacities and flourishing, and the domains within this uh, category are health, knowledge and skills, time use, and subjective well-being. And the final category that we looked uh, or used our data to, uh, to compare with this framework was in terms of the financial and physical um, aspect, uh, delivering a fair distribution of resources, income and wealth. So we looked, and, and a lot of themes came uh, in our, are in our data related to housing, income and consumption, jobs and earnings and so forth. So this was one of the analytical framework that we used uh, for the first paper. Uh, for the second paper, we found this uh, rather simple model uh, that we used uh, coming from Matt et al. in 2018, and it's about organization resilience. And uh, like if the, the organization has have had uh, the capacity to ad, uh, anticipate the situation and plan accordingly, and then manage and survive and learn and growth. Uh, after uh, analyzing our data through this uh, framework or using this framework, we decided that we would uh, suggest an alteration to this framework because we, uh, because COVID came in different waves. So even though uh, the institutions or the companies didn't anticipate the situation in the first wave, they were able to do so in the second wave. So uh, we decided or suggested that actually we, uh, there's a need to have the arrows in two directions. So uh, because like uh, when you are starting to manage and survive uh, the situation in, uh, through one of the, the, maybe the first wave, uh, then you have a second wave and you have to go back uh, to anticipate and plan accordingly. And then we also uh, learned through our uh, analysis that uh, companies or institutions, uh, they manage to adapt to the situation and in some cases even thrive. Um, so that was our suggestion uh, for improvements. So I have uh, combined findings from paper two, one and two. Uh, this one talks about the impacts. So the most discussed impacts of the pandemic were of uh, social nature, such as the impact of social isolation and local gathering restrictions, such as have been mentioned by others as well. Uh, the concerns were displaced over the experience of youth and the elderly and the foreigners. So these were the three groups that people considered to be the most vulnerable uh, members of the community. Um, the size and isolations of the community mm -hmm. produced uh, challenges because uh, I ha ha didn't bring this up, but uh, we are talking about a few thousand people living in, the, uh, in total living in this area, some of the towns with a really small population. Um, so, uh, and there's also concerns over how uh, the local health uh, service could handle uh, severe cases accompanying large outbreaks because that was what the community experienced. And the pandemic brought both economic decline but also growth to various businesses. So we also saw some companies thrive. Uh, in terms of the coping strategies, to give you some examples, many of the coping strategies reported steam from the nature of the community itself. So uh, local, uh, lo the challenges uh, were the size and the isolation of the co community. It would, uh, in some cases, it protected the society, but sometimes it w uh, was a risk factor. So uh, easy access to high quality outdoor uh, recreation, like hiking, skiing, and the ability to take socially Distance walk with friends were examples of the positive uh, uh, benefits of being so isolated. Uh, increased community resilience from experiences dealing with past disasters. So we have had uh, avalanches, um, sea accidents and such in this area. So this was helping the co community actually deal with situation uh, because they have already dealt with other types of, of issues. A uh, small size of community enables easy sharing of inf information between uh, community members and easy access to the community on the part of the local uh, planners, but also increased family time and remote working help many to cope during the pandemic, though a lack of childcare combined with working and studying from home also provided challenges for some. Um, and then uh, in terms of foreign res uh, residents and immigrants in, uh, in this area, uh, there were, uh, to begin with, insufficient information to foreign in foreign languages about the impacts of the pandemic 
and mandatory restrictions on, for, such as on gathering limits and mask wearing. So uh, later on, they started to translate this also in, into other languages. So difficulties in uh, rehousing infect, uh, infected uh, foreign students at the local university center who lived in multi-occupancy properties due to the limited housing availability in the town of Isafjörður and the lack of quarantine hotel. So, but we had such uh, facilities in Reykjavik in the capital area. So this was not... Uh, uh, possible in this, uh, so that this created uh, a lot of problems for those running the operating the university center. Uh, limited possibility to visit family and loved ones in one uh, in home country, and that was uh, the issue brought up by the foreigners that we discussed this with. And the last that I want to mention is uh, are the learnings. So uh, business owners that managed to thrive during the crisis were those that uh, success successfully adapted their operations and uh, proved flexible in the face of changing circum circumstances. So we have many examples of this. Um, and uh, one of the things that we also draw as a learning from this is that national regulations, they do not always factor into the local circumstances. So um, sometimes there were no cases in Westfjords, but they, were, uh, they had to follow the rules in the capital area or, or in, in the country as a whole, like a limited uh, gathering of 20 people, but there were no cases there. Or, but in other cases, they actually had to follow even stricter rules than the rest of the country. So you need to take the local uh, situation into uh, considerations. And this suggests a need for integrating flexible approaches to national mandates that's uh, enabling local conditions to be considered. And then a clear national policy with a capacity for slight alterations uh, on the local level could prove helpful in the future crisis. And what was beneficial in Iceland in general, but also in this uh, area, was public trust in, in the health authorities and the government. And respect for public officials responsible for setting Iceland's uh, policy. It helps ensure compliance with the public health, health measures. The issue was mainly uh, brought up in terms of the foreigners, uh, the immigrants in Iceland, because the, to begin with, when they didn't have uh, news in uh, their own language, they uh, s uh, did seek uh, information from their home country where the trust in the government was not the same and there was a lot of misinformation uh, in other groups than the, those that spoke Icelandic. And the increased remote work was viewed as a key development uh, for the area as a whole to help the community go forward as a means of increasing opportunity for, for those living in remote areas as well as minimizing the cost and time of always needing to go to Reykjavik for meetings. Because this is also an issue in this area where you have, uh, you cannot fly every day and there's a lot of like bad weather conditions or whatever. So people don't uh, usually have to fly the day before and go home the day after. So there was also a lot of time that they saved actually by being able to work from home. So this was my last slide, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we now have time. So again, I can see, I, I love from the very beginning of walking through, walking through the land and finding paths and understanding that that's really how we have to, how we've had to deal with this uh, crisis around the world. But I love the, the sense of how a community can see this about traveling across the land. I think this is the very first slide and understanding of picking your path and adapting as you go to really then the structural, we, we need to adapt as we manage. <laughs> I, I loved how that all came together in the end. Um, I wanna open up for people to have uh, questions for this incredible panel from all the different perspectives we've seen and where they're going next. And I'm gonna start with Lisa Adams. Dr. Lisa Adams, we wait for the microphone. Well, thank you all for those really wonderful and condensed um, presentations. I'm sure there's a lot more that you uh, could have said about the work that you've done, and congratulations on the really rigorous research that you've all completed. Um, I, I was really interested in what was touched on a little bit in your last presentation, and Christina, you sort of touched on it too, recognizing that so much um, was able to be accomplished because of the community values and the, the community strengths. I'm also interested in that interface with the health um, sector, 
with the healthcare system and the public health service because as you probably are well aware, we that was a disastrous part of the U.S. COVID response um, in most of the U.S. And, and my CDC friend refers to us as having a bankruptcy of trust now. So I'm curious how having that collectivism, that, that community-focused um, approach, how that affected or, or not the interactions and the interface with the um, health and public health systems. Yes. Uh, is that directed at anyone in particular? <laughs> um, who would like to start? Do you want to go first? You. <clears throat> Katie's got ready. Well, speaking <laughs> of the country that we live in, <clears throat> so I would say that even though perhaps there's a bankruptcy of trust on a national level, I think when we look at um, the individual community level, um, there can be a lot, the situation can look quite different. For example, in Alaska, you know, we not only have, of course, federal systems which came into play in the pandemic, you know, things like the CARES Act and national leadership, which you're probably well aware of, um, but also there's uh, tribal health systems. So in Alaska, there's IHS-funded institutions, as well as regional health corporations. In the area that we were working in, there's the Yukon Kuskokwim Health Corporation, um, which translated kind of CDC-level mandates into that local regional context. But then I think a huge player was also the tribal um, village corporations. So there's a tribal council in Bethel that we had worked with, as well as a tribal council in Nunapachuk. Um, and really that local level, I think, was where a lot of that trust was. And I think if you pass the microphone directly in front of you, Ayagushuk may be able to address that um, just a little bit as well. Thank you. Um I, I believe the um, interface and communications shifted to local ways of understanding, um, not necessarily to meet and uh, comply to something else that's in design. So in, in, our, in many of the communities, I believe, um, even though a village might lock down and stop people from com uh, commerce coming to pick up supplies from the local store. That kept that had to happen despite the lockdowns. So, uh, for example, if if one community was close enough to another one with supplies they don't have in their community, they could easily get on their smartphone and place an order get that filled, and they'd have code workers fill the order, bring it halfway across the trail during on a frozen tundra uh, trail, and have the order be picked up, no contact. Mm -hmm. So those are, that's just a, one example of how integration maybe was adapted into uh, existing commerce. So I hope that helps yeah, answer. Yes. connected with and um, I'm currently living in Bethel uh, employed by uh, YKHC Yukon Kuskokwim Health Corporation uh, assisting with uh, a wellness program where it pulls our Yupi cultural strengths into the, the content and adapting it into um, behavior health support and um, wellness. Thank you. So, so in in Finland, uh, Norway, and and Sweden, I think that they were big trust on the health professionals, and they were the same kind of the information coming out in many channels. And I think that, for example, 
Facebook was very good, and but also the local paper news n newspaper and everything like that. So that different different ways. And these two municipalities, uh, Utsjoki and Inari, they were um, working together so that they sent the same information all the time. Yeah, uh, I, what I would like to add is uh, how successful Iceland was in dealing with this situation. I think is because. Uh, those that were bringing the message to the population or the people were not policy makers. Uh, so we had a, a team of three people that were responsible for having almost daily meeting for months uh, with um, bringing out the uh, information about the number of cases and, and uh, how we were dealing with this. And this was the chief um, person in terms of, uh, what is your epidemiologist <laughs> this is for me a really challenging uh, word but yeah so so we had like uh, the the chief of other person uh, responsible for the, this crisis but also uh, uh, the head of, of um, health uh, authorities in Iceland and also from for civil protection and uh, that type of, of uh, taking care of the risk and how to actually protect the population. These were the key spokespeople uh, that were bringing the message to the, the people, not the policymakers. And then just a quick uh, comment from Greenland as well. And I, the, the, the same actually, like the, all the messaging and all the communication was coming from our chief medical officer or health minister. We had several health ministers during uh, COVID and then also the, the chief of police. And um, so the, the health uh, sector is very centralized in Greenland. So um, minister of health, uh, deputy chief minister, chief medical officer, they, they were all meeting at, at a daily basis and with the, um, you know, the directors of the the um, of the the whole health system in Greenland as well, and what we what what came out of our study and the general impression overall was a high level of trust in that system, but also that the system delivered and and you know people felt protected and, and were met. Um, so you know the I think that that was probably even stronger at this point, but. Um, but I think probably also related to the way the so some of the issues that were some uh, challenges with was uh, was more a language thing. So some of the communication was being uh, done in Danish, and most uh, people in Greenland speak Galatlisut, the Greenlandic language, naturally. And so of course there are translations going, but it's it's like two language systems. So things weren't coming through, and it's and th so there were some issues there that that. that I Created frustration, so that came out in her study. But, but it wasn't about trust; it was more about communication. Yeah. Uh, just from the Nunavut perspective, because our territory is is uh, it's very large geographically and very small population-wise, so um, the Nunavut government was very open communicating with people regularly and trying to reach them where they were, like through the radio, through Facebook, through live um, press conferences that we would all tune into at 11 a.m. every day. <laughs> and, and then, um, but there was a greater understanding, I think, overall of the fact that we are working for them, you know, like these are my daughters, I just wish to acknowledge them in the audience, that are young and more vulnerable and our elders, that just everybody was sort of coming with that lens that we are all working together to to protect our most vulnerable. And so that means everyone has to work together. And, and so our, you know, I think within the Within the extent that they were able, our government was collaborating, and we have other studies on the impacts of COVID where community members say, you know, we're really impressed with our healthcare staff, and so the community feedback was very strong. And and then um, because Nunavut's created under a land claim with, within Canada, uh, we have a territorial land claim organization called Nunavut Tungavik, and you know they were working collaboratively too to run extra vaccination clinics and help with other communication. And so everyone really was just a spirit of everyone working together as much as possible. Thank you all. 
Um, I think we'll probably do about two more questions. I know one, and I'll get over there, one online that just came in was just, and it might be just a show of hands of the, um, a question from uh, Janet Warburton, I believe, asking whether did each of your spaces, did anyone actually have a vaccine mandate? Uh, so yes or no, and, and was, there, was that part in this public trust? Was, was there a vaccine mandate in any of the countries? That's a no. All no's, I think. Well, it just it just says did 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 any of you have a vaccine mandate? I believe so. Yes, I guess it's a national version. So, but no worries. I we will move on that. I, it was a question that came in, and but let me go uh, next to Don. Thank you so much for this today. I. One of the elements that uh, we're struggling with in the United States is what the effects, long-term effects, will be of the mental health issues that came up for different reasons. And each of you discussed that. You also almost, to a person, discussed about the resilience of your communities. And are you already seeing uh, a bounce back? Is there any indication that there might be a, uh, a change there that is not showing up yet in the United States. Are you getting any information on that yet? A change in anxiety levels or whatever other metrics you were using to measure your, your mental health state? Thank you. Can I start or do you wanna? Okay, well just a quick comment though. We're not, like we don't have the data to answer that probably yet, but what we will do, we'll have, uh, the next public health survey um, starting next year. And so we'll try to address some of those issues, knowing that you know we won't be able to measure any causal mechanisms, but at least trying to, to see if people are expressing any links on, on long-term causes there. And we're, I know the, our, um, you know, Chief Medical Officers more looking into what are some of the like what were some of the treatments that were not being done right like so so and there were some pretty significant uh, drops in in levels of like who went to the doctor and who got sent to Denmark for this and that check and so I, I'm sure we'll see some long long term effects of that looking into cancer and what that means as well um, but it's super important just we don't have the data to to give a proper answer yet. Mm. So I, I can say about the uh, Sami health issue. So that uh, the mental um, health uh, clinics they are in a, in the Norwegian side. So that it wasn't not possible to to go, for example, from Sweden or or Finland at the time when the the uh, borders were closed. And uh, because of the history of Finland, uh, we have uh, the earlier time when it was not possible to go to the neighboring countries, Norway and Sweden, it was in the Second World War. And that's why the people who remember that time and, and, and feeling it has a huge stress because it has been open land. And, uh, and it, I think that, that that kind of stressful issues have been in mind and of course later on coming out uh, other things also. Yeah, we don't have additional data on this, but I think actually the time when we conducted the data, like a year and a half after we got the first wave, was really critical point in time because then there was some distance from when this happened, but still people remembered what ha was happening. So the timing of the data collection, I think, was critical. In terms of the mandate, uh, there was no mandate, but there was a lot of encouragement that people would show up for vaccination. And they had this huge uh, concert hall or, or a handball, uh, ho like a hall, sports hall, where people went uh, to get the vaccination. And you always, you felt like you were going to a rock concert <laughs> when you went there. But there was a lot of encouragement, but no mandate on this. Um, in terms of what we've learned about mental health, I think the what, what we learned in the early years of the pandemic was just the fear and anxiety around death and dying and for loved ones. And now um, it's the mental health issues that people bring up are more concerned for 
the state of things now. So the loss of, you know, education opportunities through, you know, due to the disruptions in schooling. So one community member shared their concern about they have a child who's now in third grade who would have entered kindergarten during COVID in the beginning and who still is just learning how to read. So, so things like that, that they're concerned about children not, you know, progressing in school the same way it, it would have happened before COVID. And then, of course, we're still experiencing so much healthcare system stress. So especially for us in Nunavut, where we do have a reliance in our healthcare system on locum healthcare providers, so nurses and physicians who will come in and out, um, they're not coming as frequently because they're being... Um, stressed <laughs> by what's happening in southern Canada and so uh, last summer there were some health health centers that were only staffed by paramedics for emergencies only like that would normally have a have nurses available all the time and so that it's a different kind of stress that people are talking about now in mental health but and as Christina said we're still just learning more like we're still we're still learning. I think to echo my colleagues, you know, that's not something that I think we're really readily able to answer at this point um, because, you know, it's a long-term question, right? Uh, I think in Alaska, you know, we're still responding actively to the pandemic. Communities are still locking down um, and are still making that choice when they reach, the cases reach a certain threshold. Um, there's still a lot of active cases, even though we're not testing as much as we used to. Um, so it is ongoing, and, and because of that, you know, it's not, Something yet that we're able to say, well, now that it's over, because we're not, we're not there yet. But we shall see. Ask us again in a few years. <laughs> I think said come back. Well, that is the perfect segue, um, because I was going to say this is what you've just heard so much of is data being gathered, data being assimilated in the last of a, you know, a recent pandemic. But really, this is the kind of knowledge. It's the knowledge across cultures. It's the knowledge across systems that we need as we move forward. And we are going to have the Lancet Commission on Arctic Health coming out soon. That started before the pandemic, but obviously had to think about it, work during the pandemic. We have this incredible group now that will, I don't think they're going to disband from what I'm hearing. Um, I think they can't disband. And so they're going to be looking at this now long term from so many different perspectives. And I do hope that Dartmouth will be a place that you can come back and tell us more about as you see this move. Uh, the, the, the look at the question online, it did say, you know, what about vaccine mandates, both the country and community level? So these are kinds of questions I'm sure your report is going to be talking about as well. It sounds like what I'm seeing is there's so much uh, eagerness and un for this knowledge and the way you're presenting it and really coming at this holistically. And again, very honored to have you. We hope you'll come back. And we know you're going to meet with students tomorrow. You're going to see more of Dartmouth in our snowiness. And I guess, is it raining now? I've heard it might be raining. I'm so sorry. But it, at least it was beautifully snowy and Arctic-like. So thank you again to all of you for being here. Thank you for uh, the rest of the workshop participants. And um, I hope you have a wonderful third day and safe travels home. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And we will hope to see you again very soon. Take care.